Good morning, or not good morning, actually good evening, and I am pre-recording this lecture. Um, by the time you watch it, we will be on our way to Louisiana, and um, I'm going to uh, be recording these, uh, the first two, uh, the following Monday. We'll be driving back from Louisiana, uh, and it's going to be about a 14 and a half hour drive. So uh, appreciate your prayers as we are driving back. So the first two lessons will be pre-recorded. Um, after that, we're hoping to be able to um, have the um, live class and discussion and various things uh, for you that are watching uh, through live stream, that you would be able to uh, watch that as well. This class is called Conflict Management, and I'm excited about this class and the possibilities. Um, I will tell you uh, right up front that I am still a learner. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that drew me to teach this class is that I want to learn uh, more about conflict management. And the more I have learned, the more I realize I, um, I need to learn a whole lot more. So we're going to learn together through this course. Let's have a word of opening prayer and then... Um, I will launch into the first section is going to be dealing with our syllabus and what is expected of this class. So um, let me let me open with prayer uh, this evening. Father, we are so thankful for what you've done, for the help that you've given to us. We ask, oh God, that you would just be with us in this class as we learn about conflict and then how to manage and resolve conflict. And we ask that you would uh, just undertake and get open our minds, give us clarity, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Before I we jump into the next slide, let me also apologize. My voice is very raspy. I've almost lost my voice, and so I will do my best, but if I'm sorry for the raspiness and uh, what you're hearing. We're going to introduce this class and the syllabus. Um, on this, I, I want you to make sure you download the syllabus. It is on the live stream. Um, class as well as the traditional class. Um, I tell my classes this, that uh, for this particular class, the syllabus is like the Bible. And um, much, much of the students are like a lot of Christians. They know they should read the Bible, but they never touch it. Most of the students know they should read the syllabus. And after today, they'll never look at it today at it again. But there is some important uh, things within the syllabus. And um, so again, it, and, and these are also duplicated uh, with the course information on Populate. I do have my contact information. I put up there my cell phone number and um, I, am, I am open to you calling, texting, and uh, if I think there is one watching from South Dakota or taking this class from South Dakota, um, try to remember the time difference uh, because I get up early and so I go to bed fairly early. So uh, if you text me after a certain point, I may be asleep and not hear it, but I will respond to your calls and to your text, all right? This cell number is the best way to get a hold of me. Um, I, I've given here, this part right here, I've given you my office number, but uh, if I happen to be out of the office, 
uh, you can leave a message, but I would prefer mostly uh, the cell number. I've given you two emails. I, I do this for a reason. Sometimes I will ask you to submit an assignment through email, or some students will submit on Populi, but then they will they want to make sure I get the assignment. And I've had some students and some teachers that said I never got the email. And so I have given you two emails. And I just now realize that this particular one is wrong. Um, and I went to something completely different. Let me, let me go back over here. Uh, this one right here should say, it, it does on the syllabus, uh, at gmail.com. All right, that is uh, J.A. Whitaker1967 at gmail.com. And I put in UBCA. That will not work. This here is my uh, UBC uh, email. And uh, let me just point out something because we've had some uh, people that should know better but um, have not um do not put J. Whitaker. It needs to be J. A. Whitaker. If you put J. Whitaker, it will be sent to my dad. And uh, so he'll have to forward it on to me. Uh, my office hours are from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. I'm sometimes in there after that. Uh, for those that are live stream, um, you know, the best time or best way is to get a hold of me either through email or through the cell. If you are on campus, um, if I am unavailable, you step in and I'm unavailable, schedule an appointment with the registrar and she will make sure that I am available. Some of the general information from the syllabus, and that is the course explores the basic theories and concepts of con conflict resolution. It's philosophical and historical developments, paradigm structure and functions, and issues and trends in the field. It will examine ways to implement conflict management into organizational uh, management here. Here are the objectives that once you finish this course, you should be able to uh, do these. And that is identify factors that create conflict within our life and workplace. Be able to recognize and choose a conflict resolution strategy to adequately deal with conflict and implement a procedure to resolve disagreement. Also, exercise listening skills taught in this course to improve the chances for open communication. Number four, which not lined up appropriately, appreciate how cultural experiences and diversity affect interpretations of situations. This is important because sometimes we look at it from one frame of mind and other people are looking at it from their frame of mind. Understand and apply biblical principles with conflict resolution. Here are the textbooks that if you're taking this uh, for live stream, if you're taking this for credit, you will need these textbooks. Conflict Resolution Playbook. This is going to be the one that we're going to use primarily. Um, and then we're going to do a section on crucial confrontations. And so we'll be reading this textbook. This textbook here, Crucial Conversations, third edition, uh, is sort of the basis for these two books. And very important, um, a very important textbook to understand uh, conflict management. And um, I like these authors. They're the same authors, except there's an added one here, Emily Gregory, that's not uh, with these here. But uh, this, is, this is important because they say crucial conversations, crucial confrontations. And there's a reason why they utilize that, that uh, that word, and you will find out as we get into the lesson. 
but these are the textbooks instead of just having them listed. I also have them in the PowerPoint, which I have uploaded onto Populi, and you can go back through and actually look at it if you need to still order the books. All right, class procedures, we're gonna have class lectures, class discussions, and then class assignments, very simple. Um, and for those that are taking it online, I will have um, maybe a, um, a question that you will answer at the end, nothing major, it's not gonna be a lot of work, but just so that you can get in on the discussion as well over what you've what you hear. And so the course requirement is obviously course participation. I do not take a grade for this. However, it is you are involved. And so I, I, I want you involved in this. You need to read 600 pages of required textbooks, class attendance. You will be expected, even if you're doing the live stream and doing it for credit. If you do not um, do anything on Populi within two weeks, um, then you will be automatic. You will automatically fail the class. So um, that's important. You need to get on. And if there's going to be something that happens that prohibits you, drop me a text, and so that I know. All right. Uh, test and exams. There will be some tests and exams. They're all fully on Populi. Uh, then there's a conflict resolution project. There's going to be some uh, reflection papers. That's a one to two page paper. I think there's three of those, three or four. Uh, and then there's some discussion posts that I will add. Here's the grading. Um, and I, again, I made some made some changes and forgot to make the changes within the syllabus. So I will make those corrections this week when I am in um, Louisiana. But uh, this is the grading uh, criteria that we're going to use. Course assignments. There's going to be tests over the material as well as a midterm and a comprehensive semester exam. Required reading, as I said, you will need to read 300 pages of required reading. And again, um, do not pay attention to this part because I am actually going to, for the first time, do weekly reading requirements that you will give me the total of pages that you read for each week. This is something new that I have, um, I am trying, and so um, scratch that. Uh, in, in that particular uh, area. Also, you will be required to write four reflection papers, as I've already said. Uh, reflection paper one, strategies to prevent conflicts. Reflection paper two, strategies to resolve conflict once they start. Number three, communication and conflict resolution. And number four, some classic conflicts. All of this we will be discussing. And so um, you, can, you can go from our class and write these paper. There will be a final uh, project, conflict resolution project. Um, you will be required to produce a conflict resolution plan that you would like to follow. Uh, you will choose a case study that will be provided by the professor. And from that case study, you will develop a plan to deal with the conflict represented within the case study. Your plan should include the following elements, how this conflict could have been avoided by using the strategies for avoiding conflict, how this conflict should be handled now. Uh, this will include a step-by-step -step process for resolving um, this conflict. Also, key what key crucial conversations should be avoided and what should be used. And then last, identify if possible what con classic conflict was represented. Um, if you look at the, the one textbook, the conflict management playbook, you'll understand these terminologies here. Again, this is something else that I need to, to show you. And that is 
This is what we will be talking about uh, for each class. It will be two lessons because technically on a Monday night, it is two class periods. All right. So there's two lessons. And then also you'll have see the tests listed here and various things where we're going to be having break. Um, the classic uh, or the IHC, and I'm realizing I did, I left off as well. The, um, uh, our uh, spring break, which actually uh, is in between these two classes here. All right. This is, this is the course that we're going to be, or the, the, what we're going to be following. Again, as I said, something new. I am requiring various reading. And so uh, for this class, you should have already read uh, pages VIII and through page 24. This is over the preface and into the introduction of this book. I will be lenient this week uh, if you did not uh, get it finished. However, January the 31st, I will ask you how many pages that you read of these two reading assignments. Now, it is vital that you read these assignments. If you even read 50%, tell me, I read 50%. You will receive 50% for a grade. 50% is always better than zero. So remember this also, February the 14th, will be your first reflection paper. Um, you'll see these listed here all the way down through May. And then also uh, there is a exam schedule. I, I put this out for you as well for your benefit. So um, I'm going to take just a quick pause here. I'm gonna pause, um, got something in the dryer and it's beeping. And my pet dog also is, is needing to go out. So I'm going to pause and then we're going to start into the first actual class part of this. All right, we pick back up again here uh, with what is conflict and conflict management. We're going to, to talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail. Have you ever been in a conflict? If you answer no, you are either lying or living alone. Conflict is a normal part of life. It happens to all of us. Therefore, we must understand conflict and how to manage and resolve conflict. This lesson will seek to define conflict and its ties um, with communication. The rest of this course will unpackage the conflict management resolution. This concept is an excellent thought when it comes to a fundamental yet challenging truth um, that is dealt with in conflict and peace psychology is, is this statement. Two people, and let, me, let me see if I can move my, yeah, there we go. Two people can have completely different understanding of the same event. Just remember, there are uh, no two people see the same thing. Well, let me back up, not, not just two people, but um, a lot of times people see things differently. Um, if there is a wreck and you were able to ask questions of, of witnesses, you would have different things mentioned by many of the witnesses because there was a little added something they saw that their personality picked up on and that's what stood out to them. So two people can have completely different understanding um, of the same event. This statement really explains conflict and is important. Christian people do not handle conflict well. And some of the things that I'm going to share with you uh, 
are vital for um, understanding this, all right? So I, I hope you pay attention to this. To confront someone or call into question an idea that they have presented, we feel, if somebody does that to us, we feel that our character and the good name and our good name have been called into question. So again, to confront someone or call into question an idea that they have that they have presented makes one feel that their character and their good name have been called into question. When what we do is under question, so if my idea or what I have presented or, or how I have acted or reacted, when, when what we do is under question, we are under question. And in, in, in other words, we take it personal. So if somebody says, um, I don't like that idea that you presented, <clears throat> it's not just the idea, it's us that they're questioning, that they don't like. We often attach self-worth to what we do and to our plans. And again, this is what happens. I'm not saying this is right. Remember the, the, the deal over here, Christian people do not handle conflict well. It's because we attach our self-worth and our, our character, our um, ideas, everything to what we do. So when someone um, questions what we do, what we present, an idea, then we make it personal. That's where a lot of conflict comes in. And we need to understand that because that's not always the case. I may like you as a person. I may think you're a great person, but I strongly disagree with what you do, how you do, or an idea that you present. That doesn't mean that I'm questioning your integrity or your uh, ability or your self-worth or that you are not a good Christian, all right? Um, and I think with that, it, it, it's created issues because um, mission organization, Bible colleges, church organizations can do a lot of things and if people question them, uh, you're, you're questioning God's anointed. You're questioning, no, we're questioning the validity of what you're doing. Is it really, is it really functional? And we don't like that because we take it personal when someone does that. This attachment of self-worth keeps people from dealing with problem employees or even firing people. We allow people who are not qualified or have a bad attitude to work and bring down the organization. Sometimes people are not qualified, but because we don't want to hurt their character or make them feel like that they're not Christians, we'll let them continue to work and they bring down the organization. Someone that is having a bad attitude we won't call into question because uh, we don't want them to feel that we are attacking them per se. And so we let them continue to work. And in the process, they bring down the organization. We do this because we do not want to attack their character. Now, I know the bad attitude is something that desperately needs to be dealt with, but I've watched this played out in several organizations. So in, in order for us to make a difference as Christians, we need to change our mindset that our personage, our nature, our character is attached to our work. It is not attached to our work. Remember, we've got to change that. Also, um, as I stated earlier, conflict is normal in life. Um, 
this is this is something that that is is quite interesting because a lot of times uh, we struggle with this. Conflict is normal. Um, watch any two kids get into a room. Before long, there's a conflict. All right, uh, conflict's just a part of um, our life. It can also be a key driver of innovation, deeper relationships, and personal growth if we use it properly. Whether the conflict is destructive or productive depends on how people handle the conflict. All right, this is, this is important. The friction called conflict can afford a tremendous opportunity for exciting solutions. Uh, you may be struggling with an idea and you present it. Someone says, I this element of your of your proposal is wrong, but and then all of a sudden there's a conflict. But if we will allow that person to speak, they may speak on a on a level that will give us a very positive way of of answering that conflict. So that is in giving us a wonderful solution. But we normally do not like conflict. And so we want to avoid conflict. All right. Peace and a peaceful relationship satisfies our innate desire for trust. We want to trust people. Trust is important to people, cultures, and organization. If we trust someone, we want to be around them and, and share deeply with them. But if we do not trust someone, we do not want to be around them and hardly will share anything with them. We, we close up if we do not trust. We share only the bare necessities with that person because we don't trust them. Therefore, trust equals peace and distrust equals conflict. Pollock, who is the, the one that's wrote uh, one of our textbooks, states, in this context, trust implies our core needs, implies our core needs are supported Distrust implies our core needs are threatened, okay? And so when we, when we talk about that, 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 is, that is important. Pollock then defines um, conflict as this. Conflict may be defined as the existence or perception of an impediment to one's core needs, values, and goals. This is, this is important. Interpersonal conflict is when another human being is perceived, whether real or not, that's important, to impede or threaten my needs or goals from being met. That may not be their idea, but we perceive it to be. Perception in, in conflict is, is vital. And sometimes it's real and it's factual. Sometimes it's not, but we perceive it to be. And so our mind grabs a hold of that. Pollock states this, which I thought... Um, I thought was so good. The brain cannot always distinguish between an actual threat and a perceived threat. We, we don't know the difference. Uh, it responds to psychological threats, which are common in interpersonal conflict, in almost the same way it does to physical threats. And a lot of that is fight and flight. We'll fight until we can we can run. Um, it's just the way we do this. All right. So uh, re remember, our brain can't always distinguish it. So we have to bring our mind under. Let me 
get this going here. All right. So Pollock gives, and, and I like this, six fundamental um, psychological needs or values that human feels is important. Number one is identity. Identity describes for us our, our purpose. It helps us understand who we are, why we exist, and what we should do. When identity is non-existent or shaky, a person will feel lost, confused, insecure, and hopeless. Safety. Safety and personal physical safety are paramount to survival. Psychological safety consists of two components, according to Pollock. They are, number one, the exception of future physical safety, and number two, the sense that one is safe to be and express oneself authentically. So we want to know in the future, are we going to be safe? And then um, are we are we safe to express ourselves as we feel like we need to? Um, they must, uh, these components mean that a person must feel safe and confident within the environment in which they live. They must feel safe expressing their identity in ways appropriate to the environment, to the environment is safe. The third one is care. People who feel cared for by others generally feel valuable, confident, and secure. Those who do not feel cared for or like they belong will often feel hopeless, lost, and insecure. Conflict, let's pause right here. Conflict questions my identity. It, it creates a barrier to my safety and really creates another barrier that says, you don't care about me, all right? Autonomy. If we have some control or cho choice over how, where, and with whom we live, we have a better chance of setting up a trustworthy environment. Take away people's sense of autonomy and they will become extremely defensive, insecure, frustrated, and either uh, defiant or submissive. People who feel autonomous, like they have power over their own lives, will typically feel free, hopeful, optimistic, and secure. So again, part of conflict is you've taken away con my control over my life and my choices. And that is a bad area to be in. Growth. Essentially, growth is a person's need to progress in life, such as by setting goals and acknowledging their achievements. The psychological need for growth can manifest in different ways, depending on cultural backgrounds and personalities, and can range from professional or financial goals to social and familial goals. This is important. We want to feel like we're growing, and if we feel like we cannot grow, then many a times we feel we are in conflict. Stimulation is the last of these six fundamental psychological needs. From infancy, the human mind seeks stimulation. In fact, the brain requires stimulation to properly develop. People find ways of stimulating themselves throughout their lives, whether through intrigue, challenges, entertainment, or interesting pursuits. Again, conflict is you've taken away my stimulation. I don't feel like I'm being stimulated. You're stifling me, all right? Again, these are some of the goals. So Kenneth Gangle, who you did not see within the textbook, but I've utilized his book uh, quite often makes these observations. No conflict occurs in a vacuum. Every individual brings an attitude and or a bias either for or against 
each potential conflict situation. This is important. When I come into a conflict, I am coming in with an attitude and with a bias, either for or against the potential conflict. That's huge. And when you get two people coming into a conflict <coughs> with different attitudes and different biases, you have, you have major problems. Also, he says, we observe others and what kind of conflict management or conflict resolutions we have observed will dictate how we approach a conflict situation. This is a key fact. How I have observed conflict is how I'm going to handle conflict. All right? That, that's important. If any conflict that I have been a part of and I have observed, all right, if the leader is dogmatic and it's going to be my way or the highway and you're going to submit, if I'm the leader, that's how I'm going to come across. All right. So how, what, how we observe, and the problem is, we've observed a lot of wrong conflict management, all right? Uh, and I think that's why we have such an issue today. And then based on these observations, people have many misconceptions of what conflict is. Uh, this is this is huge, and we're gonna look at some of these that Gango uh, mentions. Here are some of those misconceptions. Conflict is abnormal. You shouldn't have conflict in life. That's not possible. All right? You're going to have conflict. Uh, and so people will try to rid their lives and their organizations of conflict. All right? They consider it in, uh, improper or, if not deviant, to expect conflict to be a part of the human uh, experience. But life doesn't agree with this, all right? Husbands and wife will have disagreements, conflict. Parents and children will have conflict. It, it, it's, just, it's just part of life. Number two, conflict and disagreement are the same thing. Severe conflict can and does occur where little disagreement exists. At the ideological level, two armies are in conflict. But the individual soldiers may not find themselves in disagreement at all. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, even in the ev evangelical Christianity world, some well-meaning people leave terrible destruction in their wake due to poor management conflict or poor, poorly managed conflict. Yet they perceive, they do not perceive disagreement with anyone. On the other hand, Disagreement may be a cop-out when the conflict is far more serious. Oh, it's just a little disagreement. No, there's a major conflict. And, and this is important. Um, it may not be a simple misunderstanding, but rather a monumentous clash of values between two equally influential groups. To simply call this a disagreement understates and undermines the importance of issues involved. The next one is conflict is um, pathological. Some believers view conflict as evidence that people are frustrated and psychologically maladjusted and neurotic in their behavior. From this viewpoint, conflict becomes a disease that must be cured. To view, to view conflict as pathological 
merely clouds the picture and makes management of the particular conflict situation more difficult. Conflict must be reduced or avoided. When a person views conflict in only a negative perspective, it is a short step to make it imperative to subdue conflict at all costs. And this can really hurt an organization because we squelch good ideas that come out of conflict. Another one is conflict is a personality problem. We're just not of the same personalities and our personalities clash. And that is true. There are personalities that clash, but conflict uh, involves more than just personality uh, clashes. Conflict is linked only with anger. We only have conflict when someone's mad or angry. And that's, that's not right. At times, conflict conveys a faulty concept when we link it only with anger. People can engage in strong conflict with others and not demonstrate anger at all. And, and again, this is where a good, honest conversation, a good, honest conflict can be beneficial. And the last misconception is conflict is the admission of failure. Uh, here we face the misguided understanding of conflict. Conflict management may call for an admission of failure, and we don't want to be a failure. <coughs> and that that is important. Uh, Gengel gives other um, definitions of conflict, and I, I list them here um, that it's quite interesting. I like this middle this middle one here, conflict is two or more objects aggressively trying to occupy the same space at the same time. <laughs> that definitely will create conflict. And uh, these are just some interesting added definitions. <coughs> Several vital um, ingredients of conflict that uh, there's five of them there. And uh, we start off with interdependency. For there to be a conflict, um, we must be connected with somebody. Um, I can't have a conflict with um, King whoever on an island I'm not even aware. I don't even know they exist. I can't be in a conflict with them if I don't know they exist. But I can be in a conflict with you because I know who you are. I am connected to you. Then we come down to the second one, the interactive struggle. That is the sense that I can't let up. If I let up, uh, this, is, this is bad. And so I can't say I was wrong. So I'm going to keep fighting even though even though I know I'm wrong, okay? Uh, incompatible goals. Uh, the word struggle is an excellent syn synonym for conflict. Scarce resources prove to be the stuff over which conflict occurs. Time, people, money represent the kind of fixed commodities over which we struggle. <coughs> and then perceived uh, interference. As the process of conflict wears on, it, it can often become obvious that our antagonist plans to end up at a different location than we do. The goal may be for us to be totally supportive of his agenda. This means we must absolutely abandon our plans Um to stop the warfare. Capturing us as prisoners does not interest us. And so we're not going to give up our ideas, okay? 
And then last is the interface of opposition and cooperation. The symbolic uh, element emerges in true conflict. At the same time, the conflicting parties engage in fighting. They find themselves in positional agreement since they hold membership in a larger body, the church. <coughs> this is important. Conflict involves communication. This is this is vital, and we're gonna we're gonna have several classes where we deal with this. But conflict is not an isolated event. It involves communication in a great measure, right? And communication is either will either further divide or unite us when we have conversation. Um, communication involves both talking as well as listening. We can talk, but we can't listen. And some people refuse to listen. If we never listen, we don't understand what the other person is trying to convey. There was a situation that happened that I was involved in, and I tried to get someone to understand exactly how it was perceived by me. And I, and I made the statement, this may not be right, but this is how we're perceived. The other person refused to see and listen, but went behind the back and began to work and began to uh, manipulate to get what they wanted. They weren't listening. They didn't want to listen. And a lot for the same reasons that we've already talked about. Pollock says the primary mechanism through which we get to know, understand, and predict one another's intentions and behavior is, of course, communication, including the way we speak, write, gesture, modulate tones, and use facial expressions. Have you ever seen someone that if you put their, uh, tied their hands up, um, they wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't be able to talk. I know people are there. I mean, they're talking with their face and they're talking with their hands while talking with their mouth. And uh, it's it's who we are, and we have to understand these various ones. And again, crucial conversation. Remember that book. Um. This, this is important. Um, when we communicate within a conflict, this is called a crucial conversation. Much hangs in the balance and the conversation affects the, uh, the outcome. Uh, again, the writers of Crucial Conversation makes this observation, crucial conversations happen to everyone. They're the daily conversations that reshape your life, all right? What makes some conversations crucial instead of just normal talk? Well, they, they say that there are three things represented, the authors of crucial uh, com conversation. Number one, <clears throat> that opinions vary. All right, um, high stakes, stakes are high, strong emotions. And again, uh, opinions vary is, is important. <coughs> it can happen over, it can happen over crazy things. One of the, one of the people taking this class that's in the traditional class is Brother Phil Horde, who is our um, public relation director. And uh, Brother Phil Horde thinks that LeBron James is the best basketball player to have ever lived. I and several other people have a strongly different opinion. I don't think he's the best. In fact, when you put him up against Michael Jordan, I would even say maybe up against Larry Bird. I don't think he is but that's my opinion. That's Phil's opinion. 
Now, the stakes aren't high in this. Really doesn't matter. Uh, and we've never really had a <coughs> strong emotion, so there's not been a real conflict, okay? But I was just pointing out opinions do vary. And, and so if it's on something, on how to do something, and someone else says, I don't think that's how it's to do, the stakes are high and we get emotional, we have crucial conversations. What makes, um, what makes each of these conversations crucial and not simply frustrating, frightening, or annoying is that the outcome could have a huge impact on either relationships or results that affect you greatly. That is crucial conversations. <coughs> the writers of crucial conversations say the lag time is crucial. Lag time is the amount of time between when the problem comes to the surface and when it is dealt with and resolved. The health of an organization, they say, relationships and teams can be measured by the amount of lag time. Why then do people lag? Well, because we're faced with three possible options of dealing with it, all right? And these are very real. We can avoid them and hope it goes away. It may lessen, but it's going to come back again. Number two, we can face them and handle them, but do it poorly. Or <coughs> we can face them and handle them well. And we all want this third, this third one. <coughs> so as we, as we come down uh, to this, we're just about finished with this, with this lecture. Um, let, let me just point out um, conflict management and conflict resolution. According to Gengel, one authority defined conflict management as the process of influencing the activities and attitudes of an individual or group in the midst of disagreement, tensions, behavioral actions, which are threatening the relationship and or the accomplishments of goals. Pollock states the, that conflict resolution is all about establishing or rebuilding trust between people to maintain peaceful relationships, we must have some trust in how other people will interact with us. So again, as I've already stated, conflict resolution and conflict management involves communication. So, Pollock gives 10 essential communication skills that help build trust. And I am going to just um, mention these briefly because we will go back into this and deal with them um, in a greater measure. Number one, reflective listening. This is both actively listening. I'm hearing you, but I'm reflecting on what the person is saying. I'm thinking on what the person is is saying this helps the other person to feel heard and understood. Paraphrasing. So after someone has talked to you, uh, it, it's, it's good to say, uh, now did I understand you to say, and you paraphrase, but you leave out the emotional content. All right? Um, you know, because a lot of times when, when people are in a conflict and they give information, they're saying, your actions caused me to stay up all night. I cried and I cried and I cried all night long. And, and I woke up this morning and I'm just an absolute mess. And so in paraphrasing that, you would say, well, let me, did I understand you to say that my action has made you a mess, okay? You see what I've done? I'm not talking about that you're crying, you're crying, you're crying, okay? You're paraphrasing it to the non-emotional things. Passive listening, this is important because 
Some people don't want you to talk. They want to be heard. And they will just talk. And so if you get into that, and the book gives, uh, the, the textbook gives some, some things to do here, uh, I, I'm not doing it, I'm not giving all of that because we're going to cover it a little bit later, but if you see that you're into that, um, just passively listen. You say, yes, I think I understand that, all right? But make sure that your mood is not defensive because if I'm passively listening and you're pouring out your heart to me and I'm saying, yes, I, um, I think I understand. My whole gestures right there told me, I think you're full of prunes. I think you're, you're goofy. All right. And that's only going to escalate it. Using I statements. This, this is great because it's a great way to communicate how one feels and what one believes without making an accusation. In other words, instead of saying, when you do this, it makes me feel bad. It makes me feel not appreciated. All right? <clears throat> so what, what you say is, I feel unappreciated when you respond in an angry way. All right? Um, it's far better than saying, um, you know, when you, respond angrily, all right? All of a sudden, they're on the defense. It will be on the defense, and conflict <coughs> will escalate greatly. Exhibiting empathy. Um, this is important. Um, we all can work on empathy and make sure that it's real. Uh, we want to hear someone, all right? Uh, and so we, we want to relate to that. <clears throat> Adjust body language. If somebody's talking to you and you are writing or you're looking out the window, my body language is telling you I'm not interested in what you're saying. So <clears throat> within a conflict, I must adjust my body language to make sure I'm conveying to you right. <coughs> Along with body language, positioning. If I'm standing over you, that's a threatening position. Um, and a lot of times it's better to sit when you have discussions, all right? Because our, our positioning can... Um, speak of acceptance or aggression, all right? Uh, even how we face a person. You know, if a person is talking to us and we turn our back on them, that automatically shuts, tells them we're not interested, okay? <coughs> Modulating vocal tones, all right? This is, this is quite important because if we get to talking, and sometimes when you get older, you talk louder. This is not what I'm talking about. But if somebody is talking and you don't feel like somebody is listening and you get real excited and, and you're talking really loud and you're really, okay, that comes across aggressive. And so the other person is going to shut down. But on the same token, this is a fine, fine line to, to walk. But if you're too quiet, <coughs> yes, I understand what you're saying. I'm just, you're going to, you can come across as indifferent. And so try to make sure that your tone of your voice is right. <coughs> Mary, try to mirror the nonverbal communications. Our body gives off, not mirror that back to them, all right? 
And then last, asking questions. This, this is huge. This is important. Um, now, did I understand you to say, can, can you clarify exactly uh, what you meant by when you said, when I come across angry, uh, it makes you feel disrespected. C can you explain that to me? All right. That helps them to be able to express more and then you're able to express more. So these are some keys. Uh, the next class period, July the 31st, we're going to begin to look at some strategies on how to deal with conflict. Conflict is real. You're going to face it. Uh, it's not fun, but it is real. <coughs> but it's something with the right tools we can handle properly and uh, do a good job. Thank you very much for your uh, listening today, and I hope this has been beneficial.